Hello, Mr. Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about the poem Boat Stealing by William Wordsworth. So we'll start by reading Boat Stealing by Wordsworth, um, we'll then go through it and check our understanding of the poem. Um, we'll identify the poem's key message and the areas where we can explore conflict in the poem. Um, we'll then identify the key language, structure and poetic features that Wordsworth has used and explore some of those effects. And then I'll leave you with a couple of tasks you can complete at the end of the video to strengthen your knowledge of this poem. So firstly, a bit about our poet, William Wordsworth. Well, Wordsworth was born in 1770 and he died in 1850. Um, and he grew up and spent a large part of his life in the Lake District, which is in the north of England. And as the name suggests, it's an area of England that has a lake, it has mountains, and it has really beautiful nature and scenery. And this influences the poem that we're going to explore in this video. Um, Boat Stealing comes across as quite an intimidating poem because it's quite long. But believe it or not, um, this section of poetry is an extract from a much longer piece called The Prelude. The Prelude, as a poem, actually has about 8,000 lines. And Wordsworth spent much of his adult life working on it. He spent about 50 years working on it. Um, and it, actually, when he died, it wasn't even finished. He was still working on it, um, even even as he was dying. So this was really his life's work. And many experts will say that it's William Wordsworth's greatest literary contribution. And we're studying an extract from it, a little bit taken from the beginning of the prelude. And we call it boat stealing. Um, now, as I explained, Wordsworth spent many years, about 50 years, writing this poem, and he constantly revisited it and redrafted it and was changing words and phrases throughout. So I'm using the version from 1799 as found in um, the OCR Poetry Anthology. Um, Williams Wordsworth would be described as an English romantic. Um, now, that doesn't mean he walked around with a bunch of flowers trying to seduce everyone he met. Um, romanticism was a movement, um, a, an artistic movement that focused on exploring emotions, um, looking at people as individuals instead of as a collective society, and really focusing on nature and the beauty of nature and the power of nature. Um, so all of these things, the Lake District, um, romanticism and nature, all of these feature heavily in boat stealing. So let's dive into it. Let's read Boat Stealing by William Wordsworth. I went alone into a shepherd's boat, a skiff that to a willow tree was tied within a rocky cave, its usual home. The moon was up, the lake was shining clear among the hoary mountains. From the shore I pushed and struck the oars and struck again in cadence and my little boat moved on just like a man who walks with stately step, though bent on speed. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her, still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon, until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. A rocky steep uprose above the cavern of the willow tree, and now, as suited one who proudly rode with his best skill, I fixed a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge, the bound of the horizon, for behind was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Twenty times I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When from behind that rocky steep, Till then, the bound of the horizon, a huge cliff, as if voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. I struck and struck again, and, growing still in stature, the huge cliff rose up between me and the stars, and still, with measured motion, like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling hands I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the cavern of the willow tree. There, in her mooring place, I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went with grave and serious thoughts. And after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. In my thoughts there was a darkness, 
call it solitude, or blank desertion. No familiar shapes of hourly objects, images of trees, of sea or sky. No colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live, like living men moved uh, slowly through my mind by day and were the trouble of my dreams. So there you have it, an extract from the prelude by Wordsworth. We're going to call it Boat Stealing. Um, and this is the opening of the poem. So what is going on in this very long poem? Um, well, first of all, the persona of the poem, the main character of the poem, is William Wordsworth himself. He's writing almost an autobiographical account of something that happened to him when he was a younger man. Um, when he was a younger man, he had stolen a rowing boat um, from uh, the Lake District that was tied up um, on the lake, and he is rowing the boat into the middle of the lake, and it is night time. We know this because there's moon and stars visible. Um, William Wordsworth is very confident. Clearly, he knows his way around a boat, he knows his way around the Lake District. He's really enjoying himself, and he's enjoying the beauty of nature. And as he rows into the middle of the lake, he sees um, like a small mountain, a small sort of cliff edge, and he finds it beautiful, and he looks at the stars and it's beautiful, and the water's beautiful, and he's having a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, but as the poem progresses, there is a change in tone. We can call this a volta. It happens um, with the word when, when from, that, when from behind that rocky steep. This is where William Wordsworth, instead of feeling confident, begins to feel a bit scared, because after seeing the small mountain cliff, he is then confronted with a much larger, much more imposing mountainous cliff. And it's so big and so powerful uh, and makes William Wordsworth feel so tiny and insignificant that it actually scares him. Um, so terrified, Wordsworth quickly rows his boat back to the shore, his stolen boat. He returns it and ties it up and he goes home and he meditates on his experience with nature. It started off so beautiful and wonderful, but it ended so frightfully. The persona, who is Wordsworth, then spends some time at the end of boat stealing, mulling over his experience of nature and his, um, his own personal nature as a human. So, what is this poem's message? Um, Boat Stealing by Wordsworth is a poem that explores nature, humanity, and their relationship. Um, now, we know that Wordsworth was a romantic, so he believed nature was very important, and he believed that individual people should have sort of experience of nature and sort of through that discover their own humanity or, or sense of self. So this poem is autobiographical, um, and it recounts a moment where Shakespeare had an experience with nature and it made him understand his humanity and his relationship to nature in more detail. So where do we find conflict in this poem? Um, well, I think there's two types of conflict. Um, there's physical conflict. There's conflict between humans and nature. Um, and what I mean by this is nature has formed mountains and lakes and they're all very beautiful and they're all very natural. But then humans have come along and have tried to sort of conquer the mountains and the lakes. Um, we've built hiking trails into the mountains, for example, and we've built boats that will help us um, go out and into the lake. So there is a, a conflict here between the wildness of nature and humans um, trying to sort of engineer it and tame it and make it their own. Um, now, it's interesting that Wordsworth hasn't gone for a sort of more violent conflict with nature, for example, an earthquake or a volcano or a tsunami. Um, if anything, Wordsworth is, is just saying how beautiful nature is. It's large, it's beautiful, um, it's immense, and that alone is enough conflict because humans are are smaller, we don't live as long as nature does, um, we're, we're more vulnerable than nature is. So without nature even having to be violent, it is already more powerful than humanity, and there is an obvious conflict. Nature is wild and dangerous, um, whereas hum humans like to sort of tame things and conquer things, and there's a sort of battle going on, humans versus nature. That's the physical conflict. Um, I think there's also an internal conflict. So 
Wordsworth himself starts the poem off really confident. He steals a boat. He rows it into the lake. He knows what he's doing. He's having a great old time. Um, But then when he really sees nature in its vastness, its immenseness, its beauty, he gets quite scared and he becomes humbled. Um, It's a lesson in humility. He realises that actually he's he's mortal. He doesn't live forever. There's things bigger than him. Um, Nature is potentially more powerful than him. And he gets... um, what you might call a slice of humble crumble. He, he gets a, a lesson in humility. And this makes him think about the power of nature, uh, potentially the weakness of humans, and the relationship between humanity and nature. So Wordsworth uses a wide variety of techniques. Um, linguistically, this poem is full of figurative language. By figurative language, I mean things like similes, metaphor, personification. And I'll pick out a few of the the more important ones. Um, We have oxymoron, which is when we put two opposite words together for effect. Um, And we have repetition. That's when we repeat a couple of key words, um, either in close succession or throughout the poem, um, to really emphasise a point. Uh, Structurally, it's worth knowing that this poem is written in iambic pentameter. Um, So pentameter is when you have five lots of something, so the meter is made up of five, and an iam is when you have a stress sound, um, sorry, an unstressed sound followed by a stress sound. Um, you could express it as d-dum. Um, so five lots of d-dum would sound like this, d-dum, 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 d-dum. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, and so on. And that is the rhythm of the entire poem of Boat Stealing, And if you decide to read the rest of the prelude by Shakespeare, the entire poem is written with this meter. Now we can call, and I've mentioned it before, a poem that deals with a a big story, a large story. We could call that an epic poem. Um, So you could identify the prelude as an epic poem. You could identify boat stealing as being the start of an epic poem. Um, The poem's also written in blank verse. Blank verse is when you have a rhythm, but no rhyme. So we know the rhythm is iambic pentameter, dee dum dee dum dee dum dee dum dee dum, um, but there is no rhyme scheme. If you look at the last word of each line, um, there's no rhyming pattern that we notice, and we call this blank verse, a poem with a rhythm but no discernible rhyme. Um, we have contrast. Um, contrast is when you take a similar idea um, and then explore the different ways um, you can interpret it. So there's a couple of images, a couple of moments that get repeated, but they have sort of different connotations. In the first half of the poem, before the Volta, it's very beautiful and confident, the imagery and the tone. But then after the Volta, once nature has scared Wordsworth, the same ideas have a contrasting and opposite effect. It becomes more frightful, more intimidating. Uh, And we also have repetition as a structural device. Um, Repetition as a language device usually happens when words are repeated close together within a sentence or a line. Um, Sometimes an idea is repeated throughout a text, in the beginning, in the middle, at the end. Um, We call this repetition over a larger text. Um, We would call that structural repetition. Um, And poetically speaking, we get caesura, which is when we use punctuation in the middle of a line, usually to slow a poem down or to bring the reader's attention to a key word or image. Um, We have end stopping, which is when we have punctuation at the end of the line, again for a similar purpose, to slow the poem down or to bring the reader's attention to a significant or important line. Um, We have imagery. Um, Every good poet aims to create an image in the reader's mind, paint an image using the words on the paper. Uh, We have Volta, which is a change in tone. So from line one all the way up to line 25, there's quite a positive tone. Um, But then after the word when, that's where there is a Volta, a shift. And after that, nature becomes less beautiful and more intimidating to Wordsworth. And we have some enjambment throughout, um, and that is where Uh, lines do not stop at the end of the line with a punctuation mark and end stop but actually roll on over two, three, four or many lines. This usually has the effect of speeding a poem up. So this is the first sort of section um, that I divided the poem up into. 
Um, it is an iambic pentameter. Um, we can just double check that with the first line. I went alone into a shepherd's boat. Dee dum, dee dum, dee dum, dee dum, dee dum. Um, that means I is unstressed, went is stressed, and that pattern repeats itself five times till we get to the end of the line, and we call that iambic pentameter. I've also put a note up that it's in blank verse, as we can see boat, tide, home, clear, shore, again, on, step, stealth, voice. None of them rhyme, there's no rhyming pattern there, but it is metered, it has a rhythm, so we call that blank verse. So what I'll do, as I read through the poem, I will identify some of what I think are, are the key um, features that Wordsworth has used. I went alone into a shepherd's boat. Um, a shepherd's boat is a, is a, a type of um, boat that, that is made of wood, and it's quite a beautiful image um, that Wordsworth is, is creating here. A skiff. Um, skiff is, is a nautical term. Um, uh, that means like a sea term, and it also means a boat. A boat that to a willow tree was tied within a rocky cave. So willow tree is quite a natural image. The rocky cave is a natural image. Um, these images get repeated throughout the poem. Remember, romantic poets really loved nature and the power of nature. Its usual home. The moon was up, the lake was shining clear among the hoary mountains. Um, moon, lake, mountains, all natural imagery again. Um, hoary here means sort of like whitish or pale. Um, so the, the mountain looked whitish um, in the night sky. From the shore, I pushed and struck the oars and struck again. Um, so here we have sort of repetition on a small scale. We have the word struck repeated twice. But also um, this line about striking the oars and striking them again gets repeated later on in the poem. And we will explore the contrast, the difference between this version of striking the oars and the version of striking the oars that happens later on in boat stealing. In cadence, um, cadence is a musical term that means rhythm. So at this stage, Wordsworth is pushing the oars through the water in a rhythmic way, almost like he's creating music. That's how confident he is um, on the water. And it's a real symbol of sort of man triumphing over nature. Man has built a boat. Um, he's taken it out onto the water. He's moving beautifully. He's moving, moving musically. And my little boat moved on, just like a man who walks with stately step. Um, here, this simile compares the boat to a man who walks with a stately step. Someone who walks with a stately step might be a, a king or a ruler or a leader, and they walk sort of purposefully, powerfully, um, respectfully. And this is how Wordsworth is moving. He feels like a king. He's a young boy who's stolen a boat. He's rowed into the middle of the lake. He is like the master of nature. He is doing what he wants. He's admiring the beauty. He feels very kingly. Though bent on speed, it was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Now, troubled pleasure is an oxymoron. Um, if you're in trouble, it's usually a bad thing. If you feel pleasure, it's usually a good thing. Now here, the troubled pleasure could have a couple of meanings. It could be the fact that Wordsworth would get in trouble if someone caught him stealing a boat. Um, however, the act of stealing a boat has given him great pleasure. He gets to feel like he's, he's conquered nature. Uh, troubled pleasure might also be a foreshadowing of what's to come later on in the poem. He's currently experiencing pleasure um, on the lake. He thinks he's sort of the master of nature. Um, he's enjoying the nature. But as we've read in the poem, nature actually shows its dominance and its intimidation and leaves Wordsworth feeling quite troubled later on in the poem. Um, just before I look at the personification, I, I want to point out that there is caesura. So there are punctuation marks in the middle of the line that draw your attention um, to some key images, like the comma after Rocky Cave makes you focus on the natural imagery. The same with the semicolon after Hoary Mountains, for example. Um, we do get some uh, end stopping, which is when the punctuation comes at the end of the line, like Shepherd's Boat, there is a comma afterwards, again to make you stop and think about the beautiful image of a boat on water. And again, we get some enjambment throughout the poem, which sort of serves to speed up sections of the poem, whereas the Caesura slows it down and makes you focus on, on certain parts as well. 
At the very end of this section, not without the voice, is the start of a personification. Um, and it finishes off like this, not without the voice of mountain echoes. Now, we know that mountains don't have a voice, they can't speak, but we know that humans do have a voice, they can speak. Um, so when we give a human quality to a non-human object, we call that personification. Um, just to remind you again, the iambic pentameter is maintained throughout the poem, um, and we can call it blank verse. It has rhythm, but it doesn't really have any rhyme. Um, of mountain echoes, did my boat move on? So this personification um, sort of makes nature seem powerful, like it can speak not only to Wordsworth, but maybe to the reader of the poem as well. Leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon, until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. Here I want to focus on the natural imagery. Um, so we have the image of a moon, and we have um, the idea of sort of sparkling light, the moon sparkling on the ripples of the water, um, as Wordsworth sort of paddles along, rows his boat along, um, casting sort of ripples in the water that reflects the moon's light. It's all glittering, it's all sparkling, it's all very beautiful. Um, this natural imagery not only shows the beauty of nature, but it shows how sort of man has conquered nature at the moment. They've built a boat and they're enjoying um, nature. Man at this stage is on top of nature in this poem. A rocky steep uprose above the cavern of the willow tree. Again, we have that um, tree, we have that cavern, um, this natural imagery is being repeated. And now, as suited one who proudly rode with his best skill, I fixed with a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge. Um, the craggy ridge is the description Wordsworth has for the first miniature mountain he sees. Now, at this stage, Wordsworth isn't scared of the mountain, he's looking at it and he's appreciating its beauty. The bound of the horizon for behind was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. The bound of the horizon is another repetition. Um, at this stage, the bound of the horizon is positive um, because behind it, there are stars and grey skies. Um, sort of beautiful imagery of stars appearing on the night sky. Later on in the poem, Boat Stealing, when we see the words bound of the horizon, um, there will be a contrast. Um, Instead of appreciating the beautiful stars, Wordsworth will be intimidated by what he sees. Uh, just to explain what bound of the horizon means, here it's referring to the mountain that surrounds the lake. So Wordsworth is on his boat in the lake, he's looking at the mountains, and the mountains sort of surround him, they, they sort of encapsulate him, trap him if you will. And it's a bit like the boundary of the earth, or the boundary of maybe the schoolyard with a fence or the boundary of a country. He sort of feels as if the world ends with the mountain. That's how big um, and imposing they currently are. But at this stage of the poem, he's not yet scared of nature. He still feels very much in control um, and on top of nature. So once again, there's loads of natural imagery, moons, um, caverns, trees, ridges, stars, skies. We know that romantic poets love natural imagery. Um, if you are going to pick out some caesura, you might want to pick out the full stop after sparkling light. That draws our attention to that positive, beautiful imagery of nature and how man feels like he's conquered nature at this stage of the poem. Um, if you want to bring your attention to some end stopping, there's commas after craggy ridge uh, to make you focus on, on the mountain. There's a full stop after sky, for example. Um, anytime you want to pick out the imagery, the caesura, the end stopping or the enjambment, don't just pick it out for the sake of identifying it. Try to explain the effect it's having. So Seizura and End Stopping often slows down your reading to make you focus on a key word or image. Um, enjambment normally speeds up the poem to maybe create a sense of intimidation or chaos in this poem in particular. Um, and the imagery is sort of like a semantic field of, of nature. Again, because Wordsworth is a romantic poet, and nature plays a very important part in this poem. So moving on to the next section, um, we're still in iambic pentameter, we're still in blank verse. She was an elfin pinnace. Um, a pinnace is a type of boat, it's a wooden boat with sails, um, it's a very beautiful boat. Um, and by 
saying that the boat was elfin. The adjective elfin makes it sound elf-like. Um, elves are a sort of fictional species you sometimes get in fairy tales and fantasy. Um, it really makes Wordsworth's experience of stealing the boat and rowing into the lake sound like a fairy tale or something out of fantasy. Um, and this here is a metaphor. He is referring to his boat that he's stolen, the rowing boat, as a she, and comparing that female boat to an elf-like boat, maybe from fantasy or from a fairy tale. Twenty times I dipped my oars into the silent lake. I like how Wordsworth was counting how many strokes it took him to row into the middle of the lake. Um, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. Um, this is a simile, he's comparing his boat to a swan. Um, if you've seen a swan before, maybe in a pond in a park, um, they're quite big creatures, but they move very gracefully through the water. They look very royal, very dignified. And this goes to show just how skillful Wordsworth was with a boat. He knew what he was doing. As he pushed the oars through the water, he was moving quickly. It only took him 20 strokes to get to the center of the lake, and he was moving gracefully like a swan. This clearly shows that man has sort of conquered nature at this stage of the poem, and he's able to enjoy the view of the moon and the stars and the mountain and the lake, and he really feels like he is on top of the world. However, at the point where it says when, that is our Volta. That is when all the positive imagery and the positive tone of the first 25 lines evaporates. And this is when Wordsworth sees a much bigger mountain than the first mountain he saw. And this much bigger mountain terrifies him. It makes him realize just how small he is, just how mortal he is, and just how big and immortal nature is. And this causes a change in tone and a change in imagery from a positive tone and positive imagery to negative tone and negative imagery. And we call this change Volta. When from behind that rocky steep, so the rocky steep here is that first mountain. So from behind the first mountain, he sees an even bigger mountain. Till then, the bound of the horizon. Now, if you remember, we've encountered the phrase bound of the horizon before. When we first encountered it, the bound of the horizon, which means the boundary, the edge of the mountains, was met with stars. For behind was nothing but stars in the grey sky. Um, imagine sitting on a boat in a lake, you see a mountain, and then beyond the mountain, you just see a blanket of stars. Here, in the first half of the poem, um, the bound of the horizon is a very beautiful image. Um, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. However, after the Volta, when the tone of the poem changes, the bound of the horizon actually is a huge cliff, as if voluntary power instinct upreared its head. It's almost as if the power of nature is now beyond the horizon and is lifting its head over the horizon to look down upon Wordsworth and make him feel intimidated. Um, here we have Huge Cliff, um, and a couple of lines later we have the repetition of Huge Cliff. Um, this repetition would be a language technique, because we're repeating language here in quite a close space, as opposed to the repetition of Bound of the Horizon, which is repeating an idea over a much larger piece of writing. Um, I find the adjective huge really strange, because we know that Wordsworth is an excellent poet who could use amazing figurative language like similes, metaphors, and personification. Yet the word huge to describe something as big is very childlike. I reckon even primary school kids would call a mountain huge. Um, and I think the point of this is to show that Wordsworth, as a young man, was so intimidated, so shocked and overwhelmed by the size of the mountain and the power of nature, that even he, as a poet, was lost for words. The only way he could describe the nature in that moment was with the very simple adjective, huge. And he couldn't think of anything else, so he repeated it twice. As if a uh, voluntary power instinct upreared its head, um, I forgot to highlight it, but it, here, this is personification. It's saying that nature has a head, like a human. 
I struck and struck again. Now you might remember this is a structural repetition from earlier. When we first saw Wordsworth striking the oars, and struck the oars and struck again in cadence, this shows that he was moving his oars in cadence, musically. This revealed how confident he was on the water, and that man had sort of conquered nature, and it was doing what it liked with nature and appreciating it. Now have a look at how Wordsworth strikes the oars into the water. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature. So he's trying to row his boat with the oars in the water, but eventually he can't do it anymore. He grows still. He's frozen in terror at this massive mountain. He's grown like a statue. He can't move. He's so shocked and overwhelmed. Clearly here, after the Volta, nature is showing that actually it is more powerful than humans. It's almost as if the mountain is saying to Wordsworth, well, look at you. You tried to steal a boat and use your manly strength and wisdom to conquer nature. But here I am, a massive mountain, and I'm looking down at you with my head, and I'm making you grow fearful and tremble in your shoes, because ultimately I am nature and I am more powerful than humanity. Um, so Wordsworth is frozen in his boat and he cannot row anymore. The huge cliff rose up between me and the stars. Um, rose up here is personification. Um, humans rise up maybe when they stand up. Mountains don't really rise up. They can't move like that. So here Wordsworth is personifying the mountain. I think it's quite sinister. If you make a mountain have human characteristics like rising up and having a head, um, it almost makes the mountain sound a bit like a giant or a, a titan from ancient Greek mythology, which makes nature sound very powerful indeed. Okay, uh, throughout this section of the poem, as with all the other sections, we have natural imagery highlighted in green. We have the lake, um, the rocky steep, we have stars, we have cliffs. Um, we also have Caesura again. Um, if you are going to pick out Caesura, make sure you explain the effect it's having. So maybe the semicolon after she was an elfin pinnace makes you stop and consider the metaphor. Um, or maybe uh, the full stop after upreared its head um, combined with the end stopping of the comma after struck again really brings the reader's attention to that repetition of striking and how it contrasts with earlier in the play when the oars struck the water. So there's loads of caesura, loads of end stopping, loads of enchantment, um, loads of natural imagery, but when you pick them out in your essay, you've got to explain the effect as well. So with a measured motion, like a living thing strode after me. Um, here we have a simile. It's comparing nature, in particular the mountain, to a living thing like a human that can stride and walk after people. Um, I find this quite intimidating. Imagine a mountain could grow a pair of legs and follow you around, and you spend the rest of your life being chased by a mountain. Um, that's quite intimidating, and that is what Wordsworth is feeling here. Nature is sort of flexing its muscles and proving to Wordsworth that actually, no, you haven't conquered me, um, I'm in conflict with you, and I'm more powerful than you. And if I want, I can give the impression like I'm striding after you, following you. With trembling hands I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the cavern of the willow tree. Um, this is almost a little bit cyclical. Um, a cyclical structure is when you start with an idea and end with the same idea. So we start the poem with Wordsworth stealing the boat from the cavern next to the willow tree, and the poem begins to end, we get to the end stages of the poem, when Wordsworth is returning the boat um, to the cave near the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went with grave and serious thoughts after I had seen that spectacle. For many days my brain worked with dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being in my thoughts. Um, I want to draw your attention to the word bark. Um, the noun bark, um, we have bark on trees, um, but here it's referring to 
Wordsworth's boat. Now, if you remember earlier in the poem, um, he refers to it with a metaphor as an elfin pinnace, a fairy tale beautiful boat. Or even all the way back in line one, when he says a shepherd's boat, a strong, purposeful boat, or a skiff, like a, a military boat, um, a, a nautical boat. Um, but now he refers to it as bark. That goes to show how nature has conquered man. At the beginning of the poem, man has built shepherd's boats, skiffs, pinnaces. Um, these are objects showing how man has conquered nature, in particular water, because we can now float on it and explore the world. However, nature has intimidated Wordsworth that his beautiful boat now just looks like a bunch of bark, a bit of leftover tree. It doesn't seem as beautiful, as strong. It seems, if anything, a bit weak and pathetic compared to the power of nature. Again, loads of natural imagery, water, caves, willow trees, meadows. Again, we have Caesura and stopping enjambment. Um, just remember to explain the effect if you are going to explore it in your writing. And we have that simile with personification at the start as well, like a living thing strode after me. So we're in the final section of the poem. You've stayed with me this long. Very well done. Um, there was a darkness, call it solitude. Um, this is a metaphor. Um, so Wordsworth is calling his solitude, his loneliness, darkness. He's comparing it to darkness. Um, and I think that Wordsworth is feeling um, lonely or wants to be left alone for a couple of reasons. Maybe he feels guilty about stealing the boat and that was an action he shouldn't have done and he wants to be left alone sort of in repentance for, for committing that crime, that sin of, of theft. But I think more importantly he wants to be left alone because nature has had such a profound impact on him that he needs time to think and process it all. He started off being very confident about how he could conquer nature. He stole a boat, he rowed it into the lake, man had sort of triumphed over nature um, in, in the conflict between the two. However, nature ultimately revealed its strength. It lives, it outlives humans, um, it is stronger than humans, it's more beautiful than humans, it's more intimidating. And this realization, this epiphany, if you will, that actually nature would win the conflict against humans um, has led Wordsworth into a spell of solitude. He needs to think this over, really process it and understand it before he can move on with his life. Or blank desertion, no familiar shapes, of hourly objects, images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields. Again, we have loads of natural imagery here, trees, sea, sky, fields. We know that Wordsworth was a romantic poet and that nature was very important to him, that you could learn a lot from nature. But huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through my mind. Again, we have a very figurative um, phrase here, which uses a simile and personification. Huge and mighty forms. This could be referring to the mountains and lakes of the Lake District that intimidated um, Wordsworth. It could also be, it could also refer to maybe some of the huge and mighty thoughts that he's been having, that actually humans are not as big as powerful as we thought, that maybe nature is mightier and huger, if you will. Um, and like living men that slowly moved through my mind. So again, if he's referring to the mountain and the lakes, um, it goes to show that even after this experience, he still is sort of processing it through his mind. Images of the lake and the mountain still move through his mind, um, and that is personification. Alternatively, if the, the huge and mighty forms, um, if you interpret it to mean thoughts about humanity versus nature and, and who, who is conquering who and who's more powerful, those thoughts also still move through Wordsworth's mind. He's still trying to work it out. Are humans more powerful than nature? Is nature more powerful than humans? What can we learn about the relationship between humanity and nature? So there we have a simile and personification together. Um, we can call that figurative language. By day, and were the troubles of my dreams. So again, I sound like a broken record, but there is caesura and stopping an enchantment throughout the poem. Feel free to use any of it to support your ideas and points, as long as you explain the effect. And throughout the poem, it has always been in iambic pentameter and in blank verse.
Wow, that was a long poem and that took a long time to analyse. Um, if I was you, I'd make some notes from this uh, video on a physical copy of the poem. Um, you can then go on to answer the question, how does Wordsworth explore the conflict between nature and humans in boat stealing? Um, you can structure your writing into an introduction where you maybe explore the poem's message and some areas of conflict. Um, you might want to explore how linguistically Wordsworth explores the conflict between nature and humans. If you do that, I would definitely look at the figurative language such as simile, metaphor and personification. You may want to look at structurally how he achieves this through using a sort of autobiographical first person iambic pentameter epic poem. Um, and of which we have sort of the opening extract. Um, you may want to look at structurally the contrasting, so the, how he rode the boat in the beginning compared to how he rode the boat at the end, or the boundary at the beginning compared to the mountainous boundary at the end, and how that's changed um, because of the volta and the change in tone um, and feeling in the poem. You may also want to explore poetically how Wordsworth explores the conflict between nature and humans, uh, maybe looking at some of that natural imagery, or caesura, or enjambment, um, or end stopping, and the effects that those have. And then you can draw any conclusions you have um, about nature, humanity, and, and the conflict you see there. Who is the ultimate winner, nature or humans? How do you know? Um, draw a conclusion. So, if you found this video useful, please give it a like. Um, please also consider subscribing to my channel so you can get all the poetry analysis that I complete for OCR. And um, please also leave a comment if you think there's anything I missed that you'd like to share with me and other users of this video. And thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on the next one.